Hello, everybody. My name is Andrew Swirling. I'm here with Mary Ann Monroy. And we're partners at Garfunkel Wild PC, and we're privileged today to give uh, today's session on human resources best practices to minimize risk. Uh, just a little brief background about Mary Ann and, and about me. Uh, we've been uh, employment attorneys for too many decades to count. Uh, and in that capacity, uh, we essentially wear two hats. Uh, we're litigation attorneys. I chair the firm's litigation practice group, and we're employment attorneys. Mary Ann chairs the firm's employment law practice group. So we litigate and try cases, and we also put out fires on a daily, uh, certainly regular basis in, in our counseling capacities. And what that enables us to do is when we try or litigate a case, uh, we use the information uh, gleaned from those events, how a client handles something well, how a client handles something less than well, uh, to inform us in our day-to-day -day counseling and advising clients is on uh, termination issues, leave issues, harassment issues, e e et cetera. Uh, today's program, as far as the objectives of today's program, um, as you can see up on the screen, uh, the real goal here is going to be one of pragmatism. I mean, you have all the bullets there that, that tell you the ground we're going to cover, and we'll go into more detail about that. Uh, but when I say pragmatism, uh, every industry, certainly the healthcare industry, uh, is facing labor shortage issues, retention issues. And part of that goal is to try and minimize some of the effects of that, minimize the occurrence of uh, retention issues, and to help supervisors, you know, in the moment, have some greater sense of awareness about how to situate, how to handle the challenge in front of them at that time. You know, so our goal is to help take some of the edge off. Uh, we don't, you know, our goal here isn't to have you memorize different legal terms. Again, it's going to be practical pointers, you know, HR best practices, as the title of the, the program indicates. Strengthening your supervisory skills to promote a more positive environment leadership pitfalls, effective communications, and so on. Documentation. Uh, certainly everyone by now has had uh, experience presentations about documentation. Marianne and I are going to talk to you about it from a different perspective uh, and, and how this particular process can be your best friend ultimately and save you considerable time uh, even if you take the most minor of steps in that direction. Responding to employee performance issues. Last, traps for the unwary to be avoided. Um, so that's going to be the basic framework. Like I said, we're going to go into a bit more detail as, as we move forward. Okay, so we're going to jump right into the substance here. And these are various pointers and pitfalls that we run across on a regular basis. These pointers are applicable to not only ASCs, but hospitals, medical practices, across the board. We see these same issues come up. Uh, they're related to employee engagement and reducing, reducing risk and liability. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about here is uh, being an effective role model uh, as a manager or a leader within your organization. And time and time again, I see this correlate to the employee engagement side as well as potential risks of, of litigation, right? So when you're a manager who says, you know, I expect you to be here on time, or in the clinical, area, clinical care areas, you're not allowed to bring beverages, but you walk in every day holding the big cup of Starbucks coffee, and you allow certain people to have, you know, their coffee and maybe not others, you are presenting as do what I say, not what I do, and you are not going to get that same engagement and or be accused of discriminatory uh, treatment. So whether it's you're expecting people to be there on time, we, we always recommend, look, follow what you are, are preaching. Be engaged. Uh, the manager or leader who is disinterested or unaware of what's going on, again, more likely to be targeted in a lawsuit. I'm not saying you need to agree with what an employee is telling you, but if they're coming to you asking you to address a concern or they want to be heard or present an idea, again, the fact that you're engaged in listening to them and taking their input, whether or not you follow it, you are going to get that uh, engagement, you are going to get the buy-in and loyalty from the employee, and those managers, again, are less likely to be sued even if they contradict what the employee wants to do or you have to ultimately discipline an employee. 
circulating the department and being accessible, another really important thing, right? So if you are always behind closed doors, you are not going to be aware of what's happening. You might not see employees um, uh, having an escalating uh, personal issue or dispute, or potentially we've seen situations of workplace violence when the manager was five steps away, but had their door clo closed and didn't know what was happening, okay? I've also used the, the defense in lawsuits, the manager who walks around and circulates, right, and gives employees the opportunity to express any concerns, if and when they later bring a suit that says, you know what, they, sh they didn't know, um, I'm sorry, um, the, the employee says, you know, I had nowhere to go, no one would listen to me, I felt like I was constructively discharged. I was able to say, well, you know, the manager comes in, walks through the department every morning, says hello to everybody, asks them how they were doing. You had more than ample opportunity, right, besides the policies and procedures, to raise any concerns or questions. So that argument that they had no one to report a concern to backfired during the litigation. Cross-communicate between departments. We've seen multiple times where departments that are working at odds with each other, uh, you know, people are being do, uh, asked to do tasks that are either duplicative or uh, contrary to what another group is doing. It breeds, um, you know, discontent. Uh, people feel like their time is being wasted and again affects the employee engagement and the, and, and the loyalty of your staff. Uh, demonstrating professional behavior and communications. Andrew and I spend a lot of time when we do sexual harassment training programs uh, about this. Now, not everything is going to rise to the level of unlawful harassment or discrimination, but managers and supervisors who are dismissive, condescending, make uh, remarks in haste, um, uh, insensitive, they are the ones that expose the, the, the uh, employer to potential liability, right? So the yellers, the screamers, the fist pounders, the foot stompers, the finger pointers, uh, those are where we see the most issues come up. Yes, we may be able to argue that that manager does that to everybody. It's not about gender or race or religion, but that is not the situation you want to be in. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later as far as disciplining employees and not doing it publicly because uh, there are a lot of pitfalls associated with that. Respecting cultural diversity, another hot topic area that is very important to recognize, to embrace, understand that people come from different backgrounds and particularly in the patient care arena, people have different experiences that can help uh, improve quality of care. People may be able to relate better to patients based upon their backgrounds and what they can bring to the table. Don't make insensitive remarks about the way people might be dressed if it's a religious um, item of clothing or uh, maybe it's a henna tattoo or maybe the foods that they eat. Lawsuits come up with that kind of stuff all the time. Okay, next, employee privacy. I mean, that goes without saying, you do not want to spread personal information about uh, uh, other employees, whether on a supervisor level or subordinate level. But I want to add to that, besides not sharing personal information, don't perpetuate the gossip. Don't make snarky comments, and that's a legal term, right? That, oh, that person is, you know, off their meds, they're acting crazy or whatever it might be. We've seen time and time again those comments are remembered by those who hear it, and then when an employee is disciplined, they're going to raise it, oh, you must have thought I had a mental, you know, condition and, and discriminated, okay? Um, the, there was another point I wanted to make uh, with that one, hold on. Um, making comments about uh, people's personal information, are they married, not married, have kids, uh, you know, issues with the children, those are all things you need to stay away from. And the other thing too, don't get yourself too involved with an employee's medical issues, right? You might want to be the savior and say, go to my doctor, let me go with you, let me, you know, arrange for your appointments. You are then getting information that you are not really entitled to get and you become privy to information um, that you, 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 as I said, you shouldn't have and it could be used against you as a manager. You, your heart might be in the right place, 
But at the end of the day, when you take disciplinary action because of a performance issue, if that employee turns around and says, you know what, you just want to get rid of me because you found out I had X, Y, and Z medical condition and thought the insurance premiums were going to go up, you're now in a predicament. predicament. Don't make promises without authorities. Authority. So don't say, oh, you could probably get that Friday off, or we could change your schedule, or give you a different shift. Uh, make sure you have proper authority before you even suggest that you can um, you know, change salary schedules or whatever job changes that are being requested. Take complaints seriously. Respond promptly. Don't jump to conclusions. There are two sides to every story. Andrew and I have come across many situations where we hear one side of the situation, it sounds awful, right? And we think the person who's accused is, is guilty of sin, right? And then when we get the other side of the equation, we might go, huh, there was a lot more here to this. And so it is important that you go into investigations, that you take these complaints seriously without having come to a final conclusion, okay? Encourage employees to seek assistance. Years ago, the mentality was sink or swim. You either could do the job, couldn't do the job. We weren't going to put a whole lot of effort into employees, right? Uh, they had to learn on the job and be quick learners, okay? We still want people to be quick learners and hardworking and all that other stuff. But from a protection and risk standpoint, it is best practice to make sure that you have given them the training, you have given counseling. If they're struggling in an area, you're documenting that you met with them on a weekly basis, a monthly basis, whatever is appropriate, so that if and when you need to terminate the employee, you will be able to say, look, it wasn't because of some protected category. I gave it a good faith try. I worked with them for over a two month period, three month period, whatever it might be, and despite all of my earnest efforts, they weren't able to uh, perform the job, and so we had to uh, end the employment relationship, okay? Consistently apply and enforce policies um, on an equal basis, right? You might have the superstar nurse, right, but comes in late every single day, but from a clinical standpoint, they are fantastic. You cannot let the superstar nurse slide or ignore that lateness, but document and write up every other employee that uh, comes in late, because you know what's going to happen. That nurse is going to be in some different protected category than the people that you're writing up, and people are going to question whether or not you were motivated by some kind of discriminatory animus. So again, um, that is probably, I should probably move that bullet point off to the, to the top, applying uh, policies consistently and uh, and fairly is a, a surefire way to minimize potential risk and liability. Okay, the critical role of effective communication in supervising employees. Th this particular issue is of critical significance given the how prevalent labor shortage issues are as compared to the past. Uh, I'm sure many, if not most of you are experiencing that as we speak. And employees these days expect to be valued. They expect to be provided with a sense of purpose. And a way to achieve those objectives is through an enhanced employee engagement. So with that context in mind, it's not necessarily what you say as a supervisor, but how you deliver the message. As the saying goes, it's, it's not the lyrics, it's the melody. And oftentimes, how you deliver that message is going to decide whether or not the employee is hearing it, not hearing it, whether a problem that exists is going to be fixed or not fixed. And more than the words you use, you have these other variables that go into the mix as to how successful you're going to be in achieving your objectives as a supervisor. Engaged listening. Someone's talking to you or you're talking to them about some issue of magnitude uh, about their performance, and you have your cell phone out. And as you're talking, you're texting, and you're looking at your phone, that employee is going to walk away, likely walk away with a bunch of negative uh, perceptions. They're going to say, well, my supervisor doesn't really care because he or she is stuck on their phone. Or how important is it he or she is stuck on their phone and not really listening to me? I'm not really being heard. Yeah, I'm getting the words out, but they're just bouncing off my supervisor because he or she's not in the moment. Okay. Be attuned to that particular issue. Nonverbal communication. You may be saying one thing, but your facial expression is saying something different. I'm just using that as an example. You know, you want to have 
you know, all, all facets of your of your persona and your communication and articulation all, all on the same page. Managing stress in, in, in the moment, which we'll talk about uh, on the next slide. Discerning yourself in a respectful and constructive manner. Again, all of this is towards the ultimate objective, which is to fix the problem. You know, when we talk to people and they say, oh, we have to use documentation, so in case we have to fire somebody, we'll have the support. The, the real point, or a significant if not the primary point of taking all the steps Marianne and I are going to talk about, uh, is to improve performance and achieve success and avoid a retention issue. You know, enhance productivity, enhance morale. Your job isn't just to tell someone what they did wrong. Your job is to teach them how to do it right. And then, you know, if, if good fortune kicks in, you have a better producing employee. If it doesn't, and you end up having to discipline or terminate, to Mary Ann's point, you now have a, a rock bed of support for the ultimate decision you're going to have to make. But keep in mind, your goal here is, is, a positively, is a positive one rather than one just setting someone up for failure. Yep. So with that in mind, don't discipline, as Mary Ann said before, or issue criticism with an audience. You know, we're, we're supervisors in our own capacities. If we have something to say to somebody, we don't do it with, a, with the witnesses around. And it's not to hide it so much as we want to be heard. We want the person we're disciplining or talking to to listen and to be heard. The minute we say it with an audience, the grapevine's going to pick it up. Misperceptions will run rampant through the workplace. Take someone, speak to them privately. <clears throat> it's okay to acknowledge your own wrongdoing. Uh, if someone's not timely, you know, loading data onto the system, whatever the function may be, and you pass through that process or that phase yourself, it's okay to say, hey, look, I have the same issues. You know, you want to not, uh, you don't have to lie about it. We're not suggesting that you lie about it. But if you've experienced some of the same challenges, it's okay to acknowledge that. Because obviously, if you're a supervisor, you are living proof that you overcame those challenges, which means it's something doable by your subordinate. 24-hour rule doesn't have to be 24 hours. The real point there is if you're running hot, don't let your emotions get in the way of delivering the message properly. Walk around the office space. Go outside. Whatever it takes for you to cool down, however much time it takes for you to cool down in a sensible way, take advantage of that because otherwise the person's going to focus on your anger or negative emotion rather than what you're trying to say. Attack the issue, not the person. Someone does something wrong, don't tell them, my five-year-old can do a better job. What are you, an idiot? How many times do I have to tell you this? This is so easy. A kindergartner can do it. Avoid those kind of words and sentiments. Again, what you go is to help the person succeed. So focus on what they did wrong. Focus on how they can do it right. Forget the personal attacks. And strengthen your listening skills. That correlates with what Marianne said about walking throughout your department. Get to know your people. You know, I know if someone walks in, if Marianne walks in, I go, how are you doing? She goes, okay. I'm thinking, no, Marianne just said, okay, something's wrong. Follow up. Don't cross the line, as Marianne said, of prying into personal information, but see what's going wrong. You know, again, listen to, to what they're saying, but also what's unsaid, okay? <clears throat> I'm just going to stay on this slide for a minute. The, the real takeaway here with confidentiality is that if an employee comes to you and says, you know, I really want to tell you something, I have this issue and concern, but can I tell it to you off the record? The answer to that is no. But you have to tell the employee in a way, because certain issues, let me step back for a second, they need to be disclosed and, and brought up the, the totem pole for investigation purposes, right? So if it's something about discrimination, safety, harassment, uh, patient quality of care, those are things you just can't keep to yourself, okay? So you tell the employee, look, I'm here to listen to you. I want to help resolve the issue. I want to encourage you to tell me what the problem is because I can't fix a problem that I don't know about. But I can't promise you confidentiality. I can tell you I will try to keep it as confidential as practical, but depending on what you tell me, I, I may have to investigate and bring other people into the loop, okay? Uh, you want to go to HR if you have an HR department, bring them into the loop sooner than later because they may have other information, other background that may be relevant to uh, the issue 
uh, at hand. Now, when you do an investigation, you can ask employees not to discuss or disclose the conversation. You can't necessarily bar or permit them from doing that. There are some rules uh, regarding anti-negativity or preventing employees from uh, reporting safety concerns like under OSHA and things like that. Okay. So the importance of dealing with adverse behaviors. And there's two general categories. Um, inappropriate behavior, disruptive behavior. Inappropriate behavior, you have this laundry list of different types, belittling, or berating statements, passive behavior can also constitute inappropriate behavior. And, and this is in the milder category, although this is uh, very impactful when it takes place. The next category is disruptive behavior, where the behavior ratchets up, physical contact, throwing things. We've had a bunch of okay. throwing things mouses, things in the OR, sexual harassment is, is, constitutes disruptive behavior. The real issue, though, has to do with what do you do about it or why you should do something about it. Now, one, as you see at the top, minimize risk of claims and litigation costs. Of course, if you let the sexual harassment, for example, go, you may get sued. But in the moment, supervisors aren't thinking, if I let X happen or Y happen, oh, there may be a lawsuit. A lawsuit is something psychologically somewhat removed. No one's thinking, I better do this right or I may get sued, okay? The real impacts of significance, that should be the driving force on how to handle these problems are, what is the result if you don't fix these kind of problems? Low productivity, lower morale, higher turnover and whatnot. And in a medical healthcare setting, you have an increase in medical errors, medication errors, adverse outcomes, higher rates of depression, anxiety, and substance abuse, and alcohol abuse among the targets of the negative behavior and fellow employees. You have reduced staff performance and innovation, less communication, which in a healthcare setting can lead to an increase in patient deaths. We, we had one mm -hmm. particular case, without going into details, where the, the staff in the OR was so afraid of the anesthesiologist that they didn't call for help in time, and a patient undergoing an endoscopy and colonoscopy died for reasons that could have been avoided. Uh, team members may adopt the disruptive person's negative behavior. There's gonna be less trust. And let's face it, people come to work and they have to deal with this. It's gonna affect their performance generally. Those are the kinds of impacts you need or should want to avoid uh, and, and deal with. So don't let that go unchecked, okay? And again, that reminder, attack the issue, not the person when dealing with it. Right, now we're going to talk about documentation. Uh, many of you on this call may have spoken to Andrew or I in the past, and whenever you come to us with an issue regarding an employee, one of the first questions you're going to have us uh, hear from us is, what's the documentation of the performance issue? What's the documentation of the incident, okay? It's a great litigation tool, for instance, performance reviews that show uh, you know, that there are real issues that have been documented. When we get rid of the employee because of performance issues and I can show the corresponding documentation, it's a defense <clears throat> litigation tool. On the flip side, it's a sword if all the reviews are absolutely wonderful and I'm trying to say I had to get rid of the person because of performance issues. It establishes the record, it informs employees of what's expected of them, so you give them a disciplinary notice or a counseling notice they now know what the expectation is. There's no surprises if and when there's further disciplinary action. Uh, a few of the types of documentation, that, uh, there are a couple things I really want to focus on. So the performance evaluation. I know it's hard to find time during the year to make these happen, but this is a critical piece of information. Um, that and it, we really recommend that you get this done at least on an annual basis, okay? Because, and when you do them, your supervisors and managers have to be honest about the evaluations. If I open up the evaluation and the rating is one to five and they're all five and they're perfect in every area, but six months later you want to terminate them, you have a potential problem there if the person claims discrimination and you're saying, oh no, their performance is horrendous. People fail bad about putting a negative performance um, eval together, but you have to be honest. We always say do like the, the sandwich method of presenting these evaluations. You start with the good stuff, you put in the middle, the sandwich meat, you put the, the, the areas of improvement, and you end on a positive note. Make sure you have goals set for the next year, you reviewed the prior goals, 
and you put down the things that you expect to happen. I want you to improve your accuracy and data input, or I want you to attend a training program in X, Y, and Z. It's all spelled out, okay? It motivates improvement, productivity. It shows that you're invested in the employee. But most importantly, be truthful. Avoid inflammatory words, as Andrew was saying before, about the message. You want to address the conduct or the performance, not personal attacks. Okay. Uh, and I'll just stay on this for a minute. Documenting, documenting, documenting. It doesn't have to be perfect in the sense you have to follow a certain form. It could be in some instances as simple as an email. Person comes in late a couple of times in a particular week, shoot them an email that says, you know, so and so, you know, it's come to my attention that for the last three days you've been 15 minutes late. Uh, please make sure that you address this and get here on a timely fashion, throw it into the personnel file or just keep a record of it. And then if and when it continues, move to your next step. Then write a more formal disciplinary document and you'll be able to then reference back and say, look, I spoke to you three times, I sent you two emails, you know, now you're getting this warning, okay? Uh, you're also not going to blindside the employees. Like so, for instance, I was dealing with the case uh, physician was being terminated. Uh, they must have, because they must have been 20 patient complaints, right? But the physician was never told about the patient complaints up until the moment that they were being terminated. And guess what? 10 minutes before the termination, and I'm exaggerating, it might have been the day before, the physician says that um, she's pregnant, right? Had there been those write ups beforehand and she was put on alert about the patient complaints, we would have been, you know, it's a stronger defense position to say it wasn't because she said she was pregnant, it's because we've had these ongoing issues. Um, addressing and documenting performance issues, that's what I said before. The disciplinary notice, right, and I'll just give you uh, a broad sweeping uh, description here. I don't want, or I wouldn't suggest a blow by blow of the incident and what happened. At 8.52, the person came in and went over to their fr friend's desk and was rude. Summarize it in two sentences. You engaged in aggressively threatening verbal conduct towards a coworker, right, in violation of our workplace, you know, policy, standards, and whatever it might be. Uh, you'll have other documentation off to the side when you had investigated the incident. Avoid the inflammatory words again, details the plan of correction. So it's going to say, you know, you are to engage in professional, courteous communications and refrain from any further uh, uh, misconduct of the same or similar nature. Something of that effect, right, depending on what it is. You will, you know, uh, take all actions necessary to report to work on a timely fashion, uh, and we are going to monitor you over the next three months, whatever it might be. Failure to improve may result in further disciplinary action up to and including termination. They are now on notice, okay? If there's a contract, cross-reference the contract. If you fail to comply, this might constitute grounds for termination. All right, traps for the unwary to be avoided. Uh, you've probably, and you should have, given the New York State requirement, have attended presentations, whether it's online or in person, about sexual harassment and so on, where you get a lot of the definitions. Sexual harassment is X, harassment is this, and so on. Uh, at the end of the day, even if something doesn't fall within the category of harassment or sexual harassment, it doesn't mean that it's okay. Uh, the real focus should be on what's acceptable in the workplace. And if you use that as your guideline, you're not going to get hung up on how do I handle this situation, whether it's something you perceive in front of you or that you hear about. And, and we've come up with this three-part test where if you apply it in any given circumstance, you're going to come to the right conclusion, at least from our perspective as employment lawyers and, and, and litigation attorneys. What I do is say it in front of my significant other. What I do is say it in front of my boss. What I do is say it in front of a newspaper reporter. If you can't say yes to all three of those questions, don't do it, don't say it. And likewise, as a supervisor, you're asking yourself those same three questions. If there's something going on that you hear about or see, and you do that three-part test, rather than say, okay, what was that legal definition again? Use this. It's a lot easier, and it'll help guide you in the moment. Uh, more often than not, if not in, in all instances, you're going to come to the right conclusion.
Okay, just briefly, I want to touch upon um, harassment issues, okay? So unlawful harassment is the unwelcome conduct, okay, based upon a protected characteristic of, such as sex, race, religion, and national origin, okay? It is very important to understand that doesn't mean you can't be, you know, just because um, maybe it's a personal dispute or the way you communicate may be perceived as hostile, you know, that's where we see people get themselves in trouble quite a bit, right? It might not be unlawful, but you could be accused of engaging in the unlawful har harassment when uh, your conduct is per perceived as being condescending dismissive, the tone, the eye rolling, right? So many times we're called in to investigate a harassment or hostile work environment claim, and at the end of the day, after a multitude of interviews, I might be hearing the same theme. That manager is nasty, right? That manager yells all the time, screams all the time. You know, that's where we run into an issue. Sexual harassment, again, unwelcome behavior, but it's based upon, a per, a, you know, um, of, uh, conduct of a sexual nature, right? The quid pro quo, do this for me, go on a date, sleep with me, you're going to get a raise. Uh, if not, you won't get a raise. And the hostile work environment is just the atmosphere is permeated with uh, types of behavior of a sexual nature that makes the environment you're unwilling, you're unable to work. So if your coworker is watching pornographic movies while you're trying to, you know, work at your computer desk, right? That would be a hostile work environment of the sexual harassment variety. Okay. And again, we're not doing a deep dive into sexual harassment. It's its own standalone program, but we just want to focus through some photographs and images on circumstances that do arise in the workplace with a fair amount of frequency and certain issues that arise. Hugging. Is it okay? Is it not okay? And a lot of it depends on the hug. You know, is the hug, is it a celebratory hug? Someone has a milestone birthday, a milestone event. You give them a quick hug, you get in, you get out likely you're going to be fine. But if you hold the hug a little too close and the tooth a little too long, different story. Another point about hugging, and we've given plenty of sessions on this, let's say I supervise 10 people and they only give those celebratory hugs to my favorite three. Mm -hmm. Might not be sexual harassment, but like what possible issues can that give rise to in terms of favoritism, perceptions that something may be going on, workplace unfairness, or worse, discrimination. You only hug these three people, but not the ones who are not members of a protected class. So something to think about. And again, the point of what Marianne and I are trying to do today is to increase your awareness. Standing in close quarters give rise to a lot of sexual, uh, probably about a quarter of sexual harassment claims are based upon that. Uh, we know in, in ASCs, uh, you know, you're in an endo suite or something like that, the quarters can be close. So you have to be more aware of where you're standing in relation to one of your, your, your colleagues, you know, in those small areas. You know, again, something to think about. Some close contacts unavoidable. We understand that. But it's when it crosses a certain line or if your body's positioned a certain way or your hands are where they shouldn't be, that it could be problematic. Calling someone honey or sweetheart or sweetie and so on seems kind of innocuous, but without going into great detail, those are the kind of words that uh, one of our clients, an orthopedic surgeon, used and uh, the female patient misperceived it into thinking he was coming on to her. She, she brought a hidden camera into a, an exam room, taped him, sued him for sexual assault. The, 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 the end result was fine. He was vindicated because the, the videotape showed nothing went on. But the point of this is to say that those innocuous words should not be used, or words of, of that nature, because they can get you in trouble. Uh, harassment outside the workplace, yeah. Marianne? So that's a hot topic too, usually around the holiday season, right? So you have to keep in mind, it isn't just what happens in the workplace. So if you go off premises to a holiday party, okay, you are still accountable for your actions. You go to a baseball game, you go to a, a continuing medical education program, uh, you're at a hotel with other staff, right? One of the pieces of advice we always say is, Meet on business-related things in the lobby, in the restaurant. Do not go in and out of each other's personal hotel rooms. No good have we ever seen come out of that. 
Uh, you and I'm caution people. Some people they want to have a good time. They're at a party. They drink, but they cannot hold their liquor, and they become close talkers. They become touchy feely. It's out of character for them. But you don't get a free pass for groping somebody because you drank a little too much at the holiday party, and people have tanked their careers. And, and perceptions matter. We tried a, a discrimination case in Albany. We spent a week in Albany. Good trial. Got a great result for the client. But we were very careful. We practiced what we preach. <laughs> where when we met about the case, it was always in the eating area of the hotel or the business office. We didn't go to our respective rooms. Correct. Correct. Use of electronic devices, another very important thing. Be careful of those text messages, okay? People get aggravated, uh, frustrated, and they may send a sarcastic or, or snarky type of text. Those are discoverable, okay? You might say something and you tell me it's a joke, but you didn't put the happy face emoji. I then have to explain that to a jury or to um, you know, a try or a fact as to, oh, that wasn't meant is serious. That was just a joke. There is no expectation of privacy. Whether it's in an email or a text message, it's all discoverable unless it's attorney-client privilege. Uh, and don't use your email platform to vent to the employee and discipline them, okay? You need to do those in person, follow the regular protocols, issue a disciplinary notice. When you send the one-page rant in the email, it's going to come off horrendously, and it would only fuel the notion that you are, you know, uh, creating a hostile work environment. Okay, this is a picture we, we put up for several reasons, okay? Uh, the person's wearing, the woman is wearing a ponytail, okay? Lots of litigations and, and discrimination, harassment cases involve touching hair. Pulling the ponytail, squishing the bun on the top of the hair, pulling a gray hair, feeling the hair, sniffing the hair, right? All allegations we've seen in, in lawsuits. Do not touch a person's hair. Frankly, you shouldn't be touching the person's body. You like the jacket or the material, ask what it's made of. Is it velvet, is it cotton, whatever it might be. Don't grab the, the material. Don't grab the name tag. If you can't see the name tag, don't pull the name tag to your face. Don't put your face in the person's chest, okay? Because you can't see it. Just ask them for the name tag, all right? Um, is there anything else I wanted to tell you about that slide? I think that is, is it. Uh, and remember, others watch this. Even if these two look perfectly happy in this photograph about the interaction, people are watching. What if she's the manager or supervisor and they're acting like that and he recently got a, 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 a raise, right? People will question if there's some kind of favoritism because these two uh, have some behind closed doors relationship. And this next slide dovetails with exactly what Marion was saying. Here, Let's assume for the sake of this conversation that the woman whose hands are on the, the individual shoulders is his supervisor, right? That, that is something that should not take place. Again, these photos are contrived. We understand that. He looks uncomfortable. But let's assume for the sake of argument that he's fine with it, she's fine with it. You have the two other employees down at the end there who they don't look too comfortable with it. Now, it could be that they're just focusing on their screen. It could be they're not seeing this at all, but the effect, third parties are part of the sexual harassment equation, the hostile work environment. So even if the individuals involved are fine with it, if it affects someone else, you have a problem, which leads to the question we're always asked, well, how am I supposed to know who's okay with X or who's okay with Y or who's not okay with Y? And it goes back to that mantra. What's acceptable in the workplace? Should supervisors have their hands on the shoulders of their subordinates and be in their personal space? We advise against it. And, and if you use that as your guide, then that won't take place and the other two won't feel comfortable. And if you're not sure if everyone's going to be on board, then you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. The other aspect has to do with even when you think you know, people's views change when all of a sudden they're disciplined or terminated. We get one of those letters and all of a sudden the consensual, everybody seemed to be on board that this was okay, changed into it was oppressive, I had no choice but to, to go along with it because he or she was my boss and dictated my status and my comp and so on. Again, you have to think about these things in the everyday setting. We get a lot of cases involving the shoulder massaging, right, that uh, people will say was unwelcome. I'll only say this for a second. People, someone may have been asking someone out on a date, and then every time the uh, the recipient 
of the date request comes in, there's little notes, little trinkets or chocolate, right? That can be perceived as being harassing because they've already declined for the date, they don't want it. You gotta be careful about these little cutesy things, look innocuous, but we've seen this kind of stuff in litigation. Same thing with blocking entrances and doorways, right? You're having a disciplinary discussion, but the person feels like you're hovering over them or their way of access, uh, exit or access is blocked. You, you have to make sure you're conscious of that, the body language. Don't chase them down the hallway if they're not listening to you and leave. Let them leave. And then you can document that you tried to discuss it with them and they chose to you know, walk away from you. This one fairly common in the workplace, people who gather around the other person's computers. Again, it might not be anything at all. This might not be sexual harassment and it might not be, you know, 10 people might have 10 different opinions, but give some thought to this. If he needs to see the laptop, she can just turn it to the side so he can see it from the side of her desk. If she doesn't know, and we're just hypothesizing to give you a greater sense of awareness of what could happen, uh, she doesn't know he, he comes behind her. You know, she was focused. She turns around. Where is her face in relation to his body? How, how uncomfortable a position or a moment that would be? What, what is the perception? Let's suppose he only does that with her, but he doesn't do it with any of the other subordinates. What kind of impression or misperceptions can give rise to that? So be aware of that spatial distance. We have a legal assistant. Uh, when she comes to fix, do something on a computer, because again, sexual harassment could be same sex issues, <clears throat> Marianne and I respectively, we get out of our chair, we let her sit down, because if, if we're sitting in that chair, uh, we're gonna be just in too close contact. Again, be aware of it. And lastly here, let's assume for the sake of argument that these two are, are having an affair, they're behind a closed door, nobody else sees it, okay? Everything is consensual, so it doesn't fit the technical uh, dictionary definition of sexual harassment. Is it okay? The answer is no, of course. At least I hope everybody's having that, that negative reaction, okay? But at the end of the day, even if it's consensual, it's not acceptable for the workplace. We've had a bunch of situations where, you know, we were confronted with these things going on with one person, and that's the other point is, you know, let's suppose that he's the supervisor and then six months later she gets fired. That consensual relationship will no longer be consensual. It's going to turn into something very different. And we've had cases like that where somebody, you know, as a preemptive, she was going undergoing some performance issues of her own. She complains about sexual harassment about the male colleague, shows some texts which were pretty graphic, which showed this was going on. She also forgot to give the other text which the young man still had on his phone. And they were both fired, not because of sexual harassment, but improper workplace activity. Right. Uh, lastly, with regard to this, we're going to only touch upon this for really a couple of minutes, really just to make you aware of it. You know, oftentimes uh, we'll get called where and we'll be asked, okay, the person's PTO is exhausted. Every form of leave under the sun is exhausted, but they still need more time. I want to fire that person. Can't I do it if they have no leave? And the answer is no, because if they're out for some medical reason and then they're going to be characterized as disabled in one form or another, which means you still have to have a dialogue about reasonable accommodation. The leave issue is separate from the reasonable accommodation issue, which may entail as one possible resolution, giving that person additional unpaid leave. So this comes up because there's usually a divergence between HR handling this, and they have the expertise, and the supervisor's on the ground saying, I don't understand it. They don't have any more leave. I want to fire them. I need that other body on the unit. And HR is saying, no, we need to put the brakes on. And it doesn't mean you put the brakes on indefinitely. What it means is, is that you have to let a certain process play out, this interactive dialogue. It's a very hot issue that we're yep. seeing where employers, they may get to the right place ultimately, but the courts are looking at the process by which you get to a result. And, and calling employees into account if they fail to handle that dialogue the right way. And including documenting the dialogue is critical, especially like in New York City, you have to document the dialogue. So you don't want to be caught in the technicality of, of the situation. So uh, 
you know, that's a process you really want to make sure you're following very carefully. One other, we didn't do it as a slide, I just want to mention with a lot of people working, oh, we do have it, uh, remotely, that all of the rules of harassment uh, still apply whether you're in the office or working from your laptop and on a Zoom call, right? And what I will tell you, I've gotten, and Andrew as well, many a times people, they show up for the Zoom call, they're in their bathrobe, they're in their little nightgowns, or they're in the bathroom, or in their bed, right? You have to set the, set the standards of the remote working, okay? Uh, a lot of times we have policies and procedures where people agree to the terms of their uh, re permission to work from home and that they're going to be available and they'll keep time records or whatever it might be. Because remember, if you have a non-exempt employee who is entitled to overtime and an hourly worker, you have to make sure that you have in place a method to track that time, okay? And then we have seen an uptake in a little bit of the harassment claims with regard to the expectation that people be available around the clock and on the weekends. Not everything is an emergency, so you want to be careful that you're being respectful of people's time just from an employee engagement and a harassment standpoint, right? You might want to just send an email that says, because you're remembering something, you know, I'm sending you this email, not that I'm, I want you to, you know, address it tonight, it's for tomorrow, but I just want to send it before I forget, right? Uh, so keep that, that type of stuff. And don't stalk people on social media. Don't get in proper passwords or make up a, a phony persona so you can access their information that's unlawful in uh, many respects. Uh, and I think that's about it. Uh, and we hope that you have uh, taken away a few good tidbits from this presentation. It's our pleasure to have uh, had this opportunity to present it. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.